Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Charner. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Books and Related Resources here at NAEYC. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're excited that more than 800 educators have signed up for this webinar about high-quality family child care from one of our newest books the, called The Essentials, Providing High-Quality Family Child Care. The book's authors, uh, Marie L. Masterson and Lisa M. Genet, are with us today to encourage your daily work as practitioners, as well as share resources and answer some of your questions. Marie is the Director of Quality Assessment at McCormick Center for Early Childhood Leadership. She's a national speaker, a child behavior expert, and consultant to state agencies, schools, child care centers, and social service and parenting organizations. Lisa is the director of Erickson Institute's Early Math Collaborative. Earlier in her career, she was a family child care professional and learned a lot about the way, a, a, learned a lot along the way about children's development and family engagement. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping details. The authors will be asking you questions during the webinar. To submit your answers, please look for the question box on the lower left side of your screen. We will give you a few seconds each time to answer. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask the authors, please write them at any time in the question box. After the presentation, the authors will answer as many questions as possible. Some people who are using a telephone line may experience a slight delay. You will have the best experience using the sound on your computer. As a reminder, we do not offer continuing education credits or certificates of completion for our webinars. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and you will be notified by email when it's available to view. So with that, let's get started. Lisa and Marie, over to you. Hello, I'm Lisa. Marie and I hope that during this webinar, we will begin to achieve these goals that you can now see on your screen, that we, this webinar will help to encourage you and strengthen your influence, and that we'll share some resources and answer at least a few practical questions. Um, if you read the book, Providing High Quality Family Child Care, and talk about it with peers and colleagues, then you will meet these goals far more fully than we can possibly do during the webinar. Um, as Kathy said, we will be asking some open-ended questions. You won't have time to type everything you have to say about them. We are hoping you give us one or two word or short phrase answers and type them in the question box when we get to that. So, Marie? Hi, everybody. First, I want to say hi to all my friends who are out there. I, I know you're listening, and I'm just so proud of the work you're doing. Um, and I'm thrilled about all of the times I've had opportunities to meet with you and talk with you about your work. You are an anchor for the early childhood profession. And the reason this is, is that 60% of children from birth to age five spend at least some time with you. And that's an incredible statistic. It means you're influencing um, the majority of children before they go to school and during their school experience. More than 40% of working families use family child care settings as their favorite type of care. So this means you literally are raising America's children. And that makes you both an entrepreneur and an influencer. Anyone can own a business, but when I talk with you, I hear the entrepreneurial spirit. Your vision about your work is because you are creative and passionate about making a difference in the lives of families. Steve Jobs said, I am convinced that half of what makes a successful entrepreneur is perseverance, and Lisa and I know the hard work and determination you do every day it takes an enormous amount of perseverance. We know that your work really does make a difference. Your vision guides what you do because you know you're changing lives. 
And to be an entrepreneur, you have to be flexible and you have to be savvy. And at the same time, you have to be an expert in everything related to teaching and nurturing children. So that is really impressive. And to top it off, uh, you have to be a resource provider and encourager to families. So this is a tall task with really enormous rewards. You influence your own family, um, the families you care for. You influence children's lives. And you also have influence on a lot of other stakeholders that are in the profession. Uh, Lisa and I really commend you for your impact with families. And uh, we know how passionate and dedicated you are. I also want to mention the special benefit of the work you do with infants and toddlers. This is really one of the most critical aspects of your, your work when you become a secondary attachment figure and when you provide early positive nurturing and consistency because this impacts children for their lives. You also have a chance to do something that's very different than what happens in early childhood programs. You share the cultural and linguistic background of your families, and this provides a deep layer of support for uh, children's development. You literally are the home away from home for these children, and you also create and support an extended network for families, for parents, and for grandparents. So just think of the positive impact you make on the well-being and mental health of everyone who comes to your door. And last, you prepare children with skills to be successful in school. So you're really making an extraordinary impact, uh, both on families, on schools, and on communities. So this is the first of the open-ended questions we were talking about. Um, we'd like you to type a word or a phrase to answer this question you're seeing. What is the most challenging part of your work? And while I'm waiting to see some things come in, I'm going to talk to you about what I'm remembering from my time as a family child care provider. Um, I remember particularly the challenges of isolation from other adults, um, something I had to think about how to overcome, spending a lot of time um, on my own, which was very different from my time as a school teacher. Um, very, very long days. Um, never ending housework. I am not somebody who loves housework and it certainly multiplied during the time I was doing family child care. Um, I'm seeing answers pop in. A couple of people are uh, mentioning paperwork. Um, that's coming up several, several times that there's paperwork. Um, we will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the word time is coming up over and over again. Um, how do you have enough time to do all the things that you want to do? Um, somebody types that they feel like a prisoner in their own home. I can imagine if you were any of the places that had the polar vortex last week, that sense of figuring out how to get out of your home um, and see other people would, would, would be quite a challenge. Um, I am seeing also the uh, mixed ages, you know, trying to deal with the, the different ages at the same time um, and keeping yourself organized, your stuff and your um, own space. Um, I see other people agree with me about long, long, long days. Um, also making time for yourself as a professional, not um, getting education and understanding getting understanding from other people that you are in fact a professional um, and feeling not valued. And then time again comes up over and over again. And now I'm seeing some coming up about dealing with parents, um, in both not recognizing you're a professional, but also having difficult conversations with parents. So I see a lot of different challenges coming up. All of, one, all of them are ones that I recognize um, from my own time in family child care and through the work I have done with other family child care providers since then. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide. There we go. Challenges and opportunities. So I think that challenges and opportunities can be two sides of the same coin. Um, if you look at this slide, there are two Columns, but it's not supposed to be one column of challenges and one column of opportunities. The idea is that every challenge is also an opportunity to figure out 
how to make the most of it, how to get the joy from it, how to do it efficiently, um, how to learn from it. Um, it doesn't mean it makes it not be hard anymore, um, but if you take the hard as a challenge to overcome and not a challenge that's going to bury you, um, hopefully that that's helpful. Um, one of the things I would like to, to talk about here is a lot of these are about organizations, um, you know, managing your administrative and financial needs and managing time and planning and um, thinking about the spaces. So clearly one of the opportunities for family child care professionals is to become really good at organizing stuff and time and people. Um, and that's something you, one we all need to think about how to do better. Um, and although the long days can make it feel like it's hard to balance your work life and your other life, it's also true that when you're doing family child care and you don't need to commute, those of us who live in urban areas or um, spend long times on the train or you live in rural areas and spend long time in a car commuting to another kind of job, one thing to think is, okay, I have a long day at home, but I'm not having to commute, so I'm gaining some time from, from other folks. Um, and although it can be hard to think about how to connect to folks in the community and find time for it, you are in the community. Um, and I certainly found, and I know others who find that, that being in the neighborhood makes you feel much more connected to where you live than um, folks who commute and do a job somewhere else. Um, and although multi-use spaces and and having a multi-age group of children can be a big challenge. It also, I think, is one of the joys of family child care. Um, figuring out how children of different ages can live together, it's, it's much more natural. It's how, for most of human history, children have been in small groups of mul multiple ages, um, not in groups of 10 to 20, all the same age. That's not sort of how human beings were, were meant to be. Um, so that multi-age group of children is really quite an opportunity, and especially if you get to have long-term relationships with the same families, which I think is another um, great aspect of family child care. It can be difficult to figure out how to manage your relationship with those families, but if you have the children from the family for many, many years, then you develop an ongoing relationship with everybody in that family, and that makes some of the challenges easier to deal with. Um, I know that didn't give you an, a specific answer to all the questions you asked, um, but I hope it was a little bit of a start. And I now have an, another question for you, which, you know, given our limited amount of time, um, what is it that you want to know more about? What is the thing that you most want to know more about in relation to family child care? We are not going to talk about the whole cosmos, but um, what would you like to know more about? Um, again, as I remember back to my own time as a family child care provider, um, I wanted, always was wanting to know about programs for providers, particularly as I got started and I hadn't gotten connected yet. Um, and I wanted support for my, the business aspects of family child care. So what are the things that, that you listeners would like to know more about? I see someone is... Um, talking about curriculum, particularly thinking about mixed age and curriculum, um, how quality gets measured, how do you become more organized, um, thinking about marketing, um, and particularly in this world we live in where there are other places where, where families can go and not need to, to pay for child care or, it, or they at least get part of their day covered. Um, and how to engage parents. So I see a lot of things around organization and business details. Um, a lot of thing, a lot of people talking about curriculum and particularly dealing with children from of multiple ages. Um, and then some people who are are not themselves family child care providers thinking about how to to do their best to connect the, the family child care providers they work with to, to resources. So it seems like they're, they're falling in a few pots of, of what do I do with the children? Um, how do I organize my business? 
how do I connect to resources, um, and how do I get myself to be uh, viewed as more professional, including what does it mean to be high quality, and how can I tell if I am high quality, and how can I explain to other people if I am high quality. All right, thank you. We'll try to incorporate those things. So one key is to think about business management, as you, I can tell from the, the things you all typed. Um, that is something that many people are thinking about. Um, there are some parts of business management that are, you know, requirements of licensing in your state or requirements from your insurance company. Um, but then there are things that you need to think about and decide for yourself. Um, and once you've decided them, then you clearly need to post them and share them in a lot of um, in ways that work for you, either printing handbooks for people or providing them electronic handbooks and letting them know when there are changes. Um, and one of the things that came up a lot when I was doing family child care and also comes up a lot whenever I talk to child care providers who work in centers is um, the question of late fees and payment rules. Um, in particular, as a family child care provider, you're a single owner of a business and you need to get paid and you need to think about it in a way that's fair, but it might be different for different people. I know that the idea of late fees, I personally did not want to charge late fees because I didn't want people to think, oh, well, I have that $20 to pay. I have that $30 to pay. I'll just be late. I wanted them to stop being late. That was more important to me because I wanted to know when my day was going to end. So if someone was going to be late, I would prefer to just give them some warnings and then kick them out instead of having them feel like, well, they could just pay me to be late. Well, paying me for your lateness didn't give me back the time I was expecting to have to leave the house to go to a meeting or to talk to my own family or whatever it was that I was expecting to do with that time. Other people find that late fees work very well for them in getting people to, to pay attention. Um, so you have to decide what's non-negotiable for you and be very clear about that. Um, and you need to schedule some time for that. It shouldn't be a lot of time in every week or in any day, but you need to think over the course of a month and a year, when is the time you're going to set aside to make sure you get things dealt with. Um, and because you are just one person, it all falls on you, but also because you are just one person, you can come up with rules and policies that work for you and your family and enforce them. And it doesn't have to be exactly the same as the family child care provider in the next block, as long as you're both meeting basic safety requirements and you're both managing to get yourself paid and communicate with families. Um, which leads into this slide, that it has to be a works-for-you system. Um, you need to know what kind of records are important to keep, financial records, um, immunization records, emergency contact records, but it's going to be different for different people, the best way to keep track of those records. And especially in this day and age of all sorts of electronic ways of keeping documents, you need to think carefully about what works for you? Do you take a photo of receipts? Is that why how you keep track of them? And if you do store some information electronically that is personal information, it needs to work for you, but it also needs to work in terms of keeping um, personal information confidential. So if you do keep um, records electronically, you want to be sure that they are protected by some sort of password, some way that you're keeping them safe. Um, and you can help, there are professionals out there who can help you think about insurance and tax, people who work to, you know, specifically with family child care providers, and also simply talking with other family child care providers in your area, because some of the business details are specific to your area. I was in business for a year before I discovered that I was supposed to have a business license from the municipality that I was in. And they were very nice about it, and they let me get it, and I kept on with it in, the, in subsequent years. Um, but that's the kind of thing that if I had been connected right up front with a provider group, I probably would have known about. So that's key number one, master business management. Or that's the beginning of key number one, master business management. Marie, I'm turning it over to you to talk about key number two. 
Oh, thank you. And I'm busy looking up the answer to a question, which was, where did I get the 60% statistic that 60% of children before they begin school are in family child care? And it is from a report called Years Before School. And the statistic was in a stat in brief from the National Center for Education Statistics, um, 2017. So that's a pretty current um, statistic about how many people are in family child care. And actually, the number is probably higher. Um, uh, my guess is that's a low estimate, not a high estimate. So Lisa's just really briefly gone over some business <clears throat> ah, just thinking and strategies for you. The book has more, and the book also provides you with some links and some other resources that can uh, really encourage you. And I'm really happy to talk about uh, teaching and being with kids and what you're doing with them all throughout the day. I love this aspect of our book, just really thinking about how do you use the, the spaces in your home? How do you make teaching and learning something that reflects you and your way of doing things and yet giving children the best of teaching? And so, I like to just start out by saying that learning isn't something that happens because you put out certain books or plan a certain time at your kitchen table. Learning is something that happens all throughout the day. And Lisa and I are both super passionate about just having meaningful conversations with children and using great language with them and involving them with you, you know, throughout the day and the activities that you do. So we have on the slide slide, use child-centered routines. And what that means is just being flexible. Of course, you want to have a, a basic schedule, but you want to be responsive to what children need. And it means engaging older children, for example, in, in interesting activities before you can change a diaper or get a, a bottle ready. So we know that what you do is very complex when you have multiple children. Um, it means balancing active and quiet activities and spaces. I am a mad fanatic about ensuring that young children, uh, once they're moving on two feet, that they get three hours of active exercise every day. And I can guess that most of you um, cannot say that you do that with the kids because it only happens for about one of every three children. But young kids need to get their heart rates up and build their physical dexterity through active play. And if you do that, it's about 15 minutes an hour or or three larger chunks of time, you'll see those results in the way children are able to focus on quiet activities. You will really see that in the way they fall asleep for naps and settle down for rest time. It also means using what you have, open-ended materials in your home, and Lisa's going to talk about that a little bit. But things like using food containers or playing office or playing with food cartons that are taped shut to have a store providing lots of shopping bags for the young children to go to market and providing a lot of uh, materials and costumes for children to play dress up. So a whole child approach means really looking at where are children and what are they learning? I ask this question, what skills are emerging and focus on what can we give children and do with children to promote learning? So that's what you want to look at is that higher end of their skills. So I want to point out also from the book on page 25, resources for children with special needs. I'm a huge advocate of individualized support and on the kind of teaching that focuses on developing people's children's skills and strengths. So you want to check out the resources that are there on page 25. And also, on page 26, there are resources for what you can be doing for backyard learning and fun. I want you to leave our, our little time together today thinking about your, your rooms and your materials and what you do with children as being a ready-to-learn setting where children can engage their hands and bodies and senses to really explore um, and enjoy uh, play with you. So you also want to think about using um, child-centered routines um, and just being flexible in what you do with them. 
The other thing you can do is share your passions. Just get to know children's interests and really match materials to what they're interested in. Children want to be with you, so involve them in your daily work. Uh, think about what they can be doing for their fine and gross motor skills, even if you're setting up boxes for them to crawl through. Mix, make sure you're matching books and organizing those by, by theme. And then the question that I just love to ask is this. Instead of asking, what can children be doing, you want to ask, what are children learning? And whether it's through music or drawing or the activities that they're doing, look for ways to intensify what they're doing. So you have to be good observers. And if you find that children are getting bored more quickly than you think they should, it's generally because, number one, they either need a change of pace or it means that they aren't being challenged as much as they need to be. And probably in most cases, probably 90% of cases, children aren't actually challenged as much as they need to be. So uh, you want to think about what exactly they can be doing that matches the age and the stage of their development. Hi, it's Lisa again. Um, you are at home with family child care, and although you may be using some of the same kinds of materials that would be used in a child care center or a preschool, it's also the case that you can have real child-sized tools for, um, you know, like a small broom that children can actually sweep up the, the dirt that has been created by their mess um, and child-friendly plates and cups that they can use to actually load the dishwasher. Um, the, one of the joys of being in a home is allowing children to learn from regular household tasks and regular household tools. Um, as any of you who've spent time in a childcare center or a preschool, um, children there will spend a lot of their dramatic playtime pretending home scenes, and in a family child care home, you actually have a lot of those home scenes. Um, so that's really exciting. I like to think of the basics. Um, there, there are four basics that all start with Bs of things that you need. You need books. You need balls. You need boxes and other loose parts. And you need blankets and scarves. And I think if you had those things and next to nothing else, um, kids could learn an awful lot from those things. Um, and you need to think, because you're in a home, um, about your space. How are you going to store the stuff that's not currently being used? Um, we have a, uh, more advice about this in the book, but I think about you store your stuff in stackable things, things that can be stacked and pushed to the, to the side, and you um, both so that children can use the same space in different ways, um, and so that you can easily put away the child care stuff when um, you want to use it for your family. So if things can be stacked in a, in a pretty tablecloth thrown over them, um, the dining room can be turned back into a dining room uh, at the end of the day. Um, so as Marie said, the two of us are very, very passionate about supporting children in being learners themselves who are responsible for their own learning. Um, and I'm passionate about this in family child care. I'm passionate about this in every education setting. Um, whenever I talk to any teachers, caregivers, and other early professionals, um, we do have ideas about what it is that children should be learning at different ages or what they are capable of learning and doing. Um, but I think that we all need to remember that it's important to follow the child's lead. And certainly it's one of the things I miss most about um, having left the family child care um, part of my journey. That group in family child care was small enough and I had the children for a long enough in terms of years that I was much more able to learn who they were as learners and to follow their interests um, than I ever was when I was in a classroom with, you know, 18, four and five year olds, or uh, when I taught elementary school when I was in a classroom of, you know, 27, 
um, 10 year old um, being in, in my family child care home with, you know, a dozen or fewer children who I knew for multiple years, I really could think about who they were and what they were interested in and build on that. Um, they're very interested in learning about who they are. Um, that is much of the curriculum for very young children. Um, I remember a particular time um, when multiple mothers of children in my care were pregnant, and so we spent a lot of time talking about babies, and everybody brought in baby pictures, and I had some after-school kids, so I had kids from, you know, toddlers, uh, I guess one baby at that point, and toddlers up through, you know, eight-year-olds, and we spent, you know, quite a few weeks exploring babies in a variety of ways because that's what they were interested in. Um, children learn by doing is something you may often have heard, and that is true in many ways. But as Marie said, children also really learn by talking about what they've been doing and processing their thoughts about what they've been doing. Um, and I see a question, and we'll get to some questions later, but I see a question about how do you sell this to parents who are worried about kindergarten prep? Um, and I think the proof is in the pudding to a certain extent. You, if you spend time doing real things with children, they will learn how to communicate and they will learn um, how to solve problems. Um, and I would say that Macy has a bunch of other resources beyond what's the scope of, of our book that help support communicating with parents about how discovery learning and open-ended environments um, and constructivist education lead to the kind of skills that are needed when children are, um, are older. Because I think it's really key that we remember that school readiness is not about having younger kids do what older kids do. It's about having younger kids be the best cells at that age, and it's also about making sure that the schools we're sending them to are ready for what five-year-olds are really like. Um, but we need to focus on the children who we have and help them to discover and grow. Okay, so we, we are, the time flies when we're with you, but we want to go through just a few enrichment strategies that can really help you build children's skills. And the first is vocabulary. And using what we call a language-rich environment. And what does language-rich mean? It means that instead of talking to a child who's putting something away and saying, put it over there, because it and there are not language-rich words that we want to get very specific. For example, put your backhoe in the larger shelf and your little red truck on the bottom shelf. So just turn the camera and the recording inside your head to yourself to listen that you're really using descriptive words and being specific in what you say. The second thing is to extend on what children say. And for example, if a child is saying, I'm dumping dirt, you can say the back of the dump truck is called a bed. So you want to begin to add in or enrich the vocabulary based on what children are doing. You want to make reading come to life by adding props for dramatic play and really talking with children about the ways that they can reenact the characters that come from books. And then finally, always observe and take notes and doc document what children say. They say the cutest things ever and share these things with families so that families too can get excited about building language uh, with children. A little girl said, my cracker fell down my throat before I had a chance to swallow. And we shared that with, with the parent and both we and the parents began to talk about how our bodies work. So just building strong words and strong vocabulary is super important. Right. As uh, Marie said, the time sure flies, so we're going to keep going. Um, creating meaningful routines is really important in any early childhood setting. And in the smaller group setting of family child care, it does allow for somewhat more individualized scheduling. Um, you need to be really regular around eating and sleeping for all the children and in getting activity. Um, but because it's a smaller group, it can be um, easier than, than in the larger group at a center to allow a child to sleep a little longer um, or get up a little earlier and do something quiet um, or 
choose to eat less at one point and eat more at the next chance that they have to eat. Um, it's also important, of course, to have routines and rituals that are recurring and are part of your family community that you create in your home, your family, child care family. Um, in my home, we, every child got to choose what kind of muffins they wanted on their birthday and help make them. Um, and we also had quarterly family potluck. And there was the ritual that the um, children made fruit salad during the day of the potluck and every family ordered their favorite kind of pizza from their favorite place. And we, it was straightforward and we did it over and over and everybody, everybody loved it. Um, and I think we've addressed most of these other points already. Okay, I'm going to do um, the next one that just focuses on child development. And I just want to say, keep looking at what skills are growing and be in the children's world to just listen and watch, really enjoy what they're learning and, and foster those interests. Secondly, we talk about this a lot, but really listen for what's important to families and make sure you are reflecting their language and culture and books and materials and activities. Notice when children need a change of pace. And again, I cannot say it enough, provide enough exercise because one in three children do not get enough. I'm gonna have us skip um, the question slide and have you go ahead and add your questions um, as we go and we'll answer and come back to those when we're finished because I wanna share just a few positive guidance tips. I think that family child care providers have much fewer issues with behavior at home, but there still can be trouble, especially when children are tired, um, and especially because you have multiple age children. So I just want to encourage you to know what children can handle. Many times you do plan an activity, and you spent time and maybe money and energy preparing it, but you get up to 11 a.m. and you just realize children can't handle it at that time. So be really flexible and shift things to other times of the day or maybe the next day. Always use simple direction. We talk about this so much, but instead of telling children what to do, ask them what to do. So if you're outside and they begin to play with a ball in your flower bed, say the balls, instead of saying the balls go on the driveway, ask them where did the balls go? Or instead of telling a child to help another child, ask what's a good way to help your friend? So ask questions instead of telling them. And then I just want to really encourage you to be consistent and also address stress um, of children. I think everyone is stressed, children are stressed, you're stressed. And many times when children are out of sorts, they just need comforting and reassurance. So think about calming music and blankets for snuggling and stuffed animals to curl up with and reading quiet books um, when you need to address behavior issues. So it's very important to build social skills, and I think the family child care environment is a very natural way to do that. It's a manageable social structure, much like we've had in human history of a small group of children of different ages working together um, with one or more adults. Um, and part of that building the social skills and being able to reinforce caring and empathy comes from thinking about the multiple ages. You're not trying to run separate programs like you would in a child care center. A family child care home is not a small child care center. It's a different type of environment, um, which in some ways makes this, this work easier um, because you want to work with them all together. Like I said, when we were talking about babies, the children of the different ages were building their empathy around babies in different ways. Um, be, and we were all thinking about the same thing, but they were doing it from their different different places. Um, and we have these longer relationships with our child care families, and so we can build their social skills over a longer period. We don't just have them for eight or nine months and then get a brand new crop. Okay, I have just a couple tips for com communicating with families, and I think the main one is this. I think it's really important to be flexible and really work with families to do with their children what is important to families. But you all need to know as professionals what is non-essential. And I think the two are this. Number one, we eat meals at the table. 
because a lot of times children are not expected to eat sitting down at home. And of course, you don't want food all over your house. And then the other thing is pick up time. So be very direct with families and say, I'm super flexible. I am willing to work with you on napping, on how we are going to toilet train your child. But when it comes to these two things, these are non-negotiable. And that non-negotiable language is really important for you. The other tip is this that families are not your friends, even though they feel like it. And it's so important for you to keep professional boundaries. Um, that's my top two tips for you is number one, don't discuss personal things with your professional families. And number two, don't discuss your business with your own family. Find a professional friend. It is so hard when your significant other or your own children come home because you will want to share your day with them. You've been alone all day. But to really boost your family and your relationships with your own family, ask them about your day. About, excuse me, about their day. Sorry about that. And, um, then, um, and it's ahead, important, Lisa. yeah, to, to think about how to grow as a professional. Um, and you do have your professional life and your personal life, but it is true in family child care that you have, for each family, the boundaries are going to be slightly different. Um, but you need to figure out what they are for you, and you need to figure out how you want to grow and connect. Um, what are the things that you're wanting to learn, and then go seek out resources. Um, and similarly, oops, embrace who you are, and how can you get more joy out of the good parts? right? Mm -hmm. And how can you manage the hard parts? That's, you want to find the resources and make the connections that let you do those things. Because you have a huge influence, as Marie said at the beginning, on so many people and in so many ways. So figure out how to get the most joy out of the good parts of, of your role and how to get the most help to manage the hard parts. Yeah, as we say goodbye to you um, in about two minutes here, I just want to say this. I think that growing is not easy. I think we talk about continuous quality improvement. We talk about growth, but it is really hard to change who we are. In order to change, I think we have to move into a period of our life where we have to like, be insecure about what we're doing. It's hard to look at what we do and decide what to change. I think it's hard to find um, professional peers who will encourage us and cheer us on in our, in our growth. But I really challenge you to choose one or two action steps as a result of chatting here with Lisa and me today. Something from the book where you really want to grow or learn more. Lisa and I are mad, passionate learners. I don't know why, but we are still growing and learning every day. Um, I know I'm in the middle of getting an ESL uh, certification on my teaching license. I don't need it, but I just want to learn and grow in every area of my work. So no matter where you are in your professional journey, just write down some goals for yourself, some action steps that you want to take. Um, and um, step out into the unknown and, and learn new skills, learn more about children's literature, more about positive guidance, more about your business practices, and really keep growing in the profession. So Marie and I are done with our prepared part of the presentation, and we turn it back over to Kathy of Macy, to facilitate the end part of this webinar. Thank you so much, Lisa and Marie, for that uh, great presentation. And thank you so much for everybody listening to with your responses. That, that was uh, clearly what, what Marie and Lisa had to say was very informative and helpful and the beginning of of a conversation, hopefully, that will continue. So we're, Lisa and Marie are, are staying on the line, and we're going to look at some of the questions that have come up while the, you were giving the presentation. 
And uh, so thank you so much for sharing um, your questions with us. So one of the questions that came up is, what is the appropriate balance for providing nurturing in-home child care and trying to meet all the legal requirements of in-home care? There's so many rules and regulations that sometimes it seems there's no time for free play and observing the levels of the children as they engage with materials and their peers. So, Lisa yeah, I, or? Yeah, I, this is Lisa. I saw that come, come in, Kathy, and um, I really mm-hmm. would, would love to answer it. Um, okay. I think that you can, the legal requirements, because their legal requirements end up looking like a long checklist because that's how you write legal requirements. But I think that sometimes it is possible to unpack those requirements and see that they are in fact being met by the nurturing in-home child care with discovery. That um, just because a, a legal list lists 10 things that have to be seen doesn't mean that those 10 things have to each happen for their own 10 or 15 separate minutes every day. Um, So I, just as as is true in any early childhood setting, um, the most productive learning environment is nurturing and it's open-ended and it involves children constructing their own ideas. And I think that it, talking with other providers about how can we show that we are doing these things? Um, you know, we read to children. That doesn't mean that we read to children for the same 20 minutes every single day. It may mean that we have, there might be a certain time we read, but it also is we have a lot of books, and when children bring us a book, we read it to them. Um, so I think there are ways to unpack the regulations, and, and um, especially with peers, and think about how you are meeting them with really nurturing and open-ended care. Marie, did you have something else to say? Yeah. Kathy, I also think um, I've I've been doing a lot of talking with uh, family child care professionals, and I think um, there's a real agreement that people underestimate how much time it takes to get and stay organized. Um, and I, whether it's on a Saturday morning or one evening a week, providers need to actually schedule in at least three hours a week that is dedicated to organizing the business aspect of their family child care home. And in addition to organizing their business, in spite of the fact that family child care should and can be flexible in terms of how we think about teaching and relating in a more natural way with children, I think there's an agreement that family child care providers underestimate how much planning does need to go into organizing materials and activities and meals and changing up the things, the objects and other materials that are made available to children. Um, I also think they underestimate how much time it takes to talk with families and communicate. So setting aside two Thursday evenings a month where families are allowed to call in, setting aside one evening a week really to get at that planning is just essential. And if that doesn't happen on a regular basis, uh, it can feel like an avalanche. It can really feel overwhelming. Well, and um, speaking of overwhelming, another question that came in is how do you stop from being so overwhelmed when inspectors come (laughs) and you are trying to attend to the children? Yeah, you Um, know what? Go ahead, let me let me just let me just introduce this and then let let Lisa weigh in from a practical level. So I have to say I'm the director of evaluation for a state quality rating and improvement system, and I I just want us all to shift the way we think about evaluation and having people come into our homes. Believe me, I understand what it feels like, but the reality is what you're getting is feedback. And all of us like being perfect, and we, we really want to show people how, how professional we are. But I think just relaxing and being yourself helps the children to be relaxed and just helps that day to go a little bit more naturally for you. So I think a lot of it is shifting your own perspective, just taking a step back 
and thinking about growth as opposed to feeling like you're being judged by somebody, who, you know, who's coming into your home. Um, I also think that um, when you're setting up an appointment with an inspector, I mean, I know sometimes it's a surprise, but sometimes there's a, a setup. Um, you can be clear about, you know, what time you're most likely to be able to have a real conversation with them. And they, mm-hmm. they know that your first priority has to be attending to the children. Um, if they don't know that, they certainly shouldn't be doing that job. Um, the other aspect is if you do have any backup people um, or support people, it's great to have other people, you know, if it's possible to not be the only person there that day, um, that can be helpful as well. Um, and I, so that, that's, that's what I have to give you right now. And, but I do think Marie's point about just, you know, be relaxed and enjoy yourself as best you can and do what you know you need to do in terms of attending to the children. Okay, thank you, Lisa and Marie. Uh, one of the other questions that came up, which uh, and I saw earlier in one of the challenges, is um, <clears throat> how do you handle parents who are constantly are late and not honest about sickness in their children? Yeah, I'm going to start and then let Lisa follow up. So I think the tip I gave towards the end about balancing and keeping firm the boundaries between yourself and parents is just essential. The reason for that is, is once you begin to develop a more relaxed or or friendship-based relationship with parents, I think it becomes more complicated and more difficult to just be straightforward and honest about what's there. If a parent brings a child that's sick, Before a parent brings a child that's sick, it's really important to write into your handbook, your guidebook, everything you need to run your business in the way you need. And one of those um, bullet points is if you bring a child that is sick, that is running a fever, that has a runny nose or whatever it is you However, you need to define that for your group of children. You will call the parents and ask them to pick up the children. I think that's really hard because you all are the most empathetic, caring, um, compassionate people in the business. And it's really hard to keep those boundaries. But remember, we talked about things that are negotiable and things that are non-negotiable. So picking up your child, making payments, um, not having sick children on hand. Those are things that are non-negotiable. So it's just consider yourself to be a professional and speak up and follow through. Right. And it sounds mean, but I think it's important to say to families, if, you know, if you keep being late or if you, um, you know, late to pick up your child or late to make your payment, I'm going to have to find somebody else to fill your spot because this isn't going to work. And and often that gets people to to think and 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 um, I have never actually had to in in family child care I never had to deny somebody their spot but I did talk to one family about it and it helped them them shape up um, when I worked in a center based environment we did um, have a couple of families who who lost their spots because they were so often late um, and then the sickness thing is. As Marie said, you've got to be clear up front, um, and they're not honest about sickness. I assume someone's meaning that they, like, bring a child, and they say, well, they're they're feeling better, and then it's clear that they um, are not feeling better um, and are still sick. And I think what Marie said, you've got that policy. You know, you brought them, and maybe you thought they were better, but their fever, you know, is here now, and so you need to come and pick them up. Um, and uh, along with that is trying to help families figure out, well, what can they do if they have a sick child? Um, are there places, um, you know, are there there people who will care for sick children? Are there, you know, um, there are, I know in, in some communities there are um, places, uh, sick, sick child places associated with hospitals um, if parents really cannot get off work, um, or there are other people who could be called on and, and perhaps one thing that a, a family child care provider group could do is is come up with a um, 
you know, list of folks who are available to do, you know, in-home child care for sick children that gets shared with families um, when you really cannot take the time to be home with your own sick child. Because I know that sometimes that that's the truth, but the sickness is just going to continue more and more if we if we share it at the family child care home. So yeah, stick we, with we your make... your non-negotiables, and also then try to support the families in figuring out what to do instead. Yeah, I think we could do another webinar on uh, communication strategies with families. I just encourage all of you to be be strong and being factual. I don't think you need to be emotional or or get upset. I think it's really important for you to know what you need and to the first time there is a family that is late or who brings a sick child, just step up and say, these are non-negotiables for the business. Um, let's talk about this and come to a solution. I think parents are respectful and willing to, you know, work through things. That being said, we all know parents that um, give their children a lot of Tylenol and send them anyway. So to go back to the um, handbook, it's just essential that everything you need is written and that it's a, an established rule or regulation. Thanks, Lisa and Marie, for that other uh, version of boundaries. And, and it was a theme that you mentioned earlier. Um, and thanks for making that clear. We have time, probably about two minutes, for one last question. And the, one of the questions that has um, come up is, what do you think about QRIS not being authentic to judge the actual quality of work? Yeah, I guess I need to step up and, and talk about that um, because of my role as well. You know, the deal with the assessments that are used for quality rating and improvement systems, they're not perfect, but they provide a, a basic and regular and shared lens by which we can look at programs. And I think one of the best things you can do is whatever is used in your community, whether it's a local checklist or a state checklist or one of the environment rating scales, is rather than be intimidated, buy the book and, and read it carefully. And I think you'll find that a lot of what's in there is pretty basic. Um, it focuses on making materials available to children. It looks at interactions that really support the way you focus on language and on learning. So I think there's a lot of fear when we don't know really what that content is and what it looks like. So I also encourage you to contact, if you're involved in QRIS um, systems, to contact the system and, and, um, and talk with a coach and someone else who can give you some pre preliminary feedback about what's happening in your home. I, I, I guess I just want to demystify that so it doesn't seem like such an enormous barrier but more that it's an opportunity for growth. Right. And before we totally run out of time, I want to say that keeping documentation of things that you do in other ways, you know, um, picture books and, uh, you know, slides and online things so that you have beyond the visit and the checklist, you have other ways to easily share more depth and breadth of what it is that happens in your home can enrich that. Um, but I see that our time is just about up. I did have a question, Kathy. I noticed that some people are typing in some things that might be helpful for other people to see. Um, mm -hmm. And will the uh, can the people, the audience, see each other's questions? No, unfortunately, they can't. Um, so um, okay. I'm sorry. That's that's the way the platform works. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I do I do want to thank everyone who has tuned in and stayed with us uh for the entire webinar. Um and thank you Lisa and thank you Marie for this wonderful webinar. Uh we really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. <laughs>